This is CBC Here and Now. To ensure that we meet the needs of the entire community, Budget 19, 2019 anticipates no reduction in services to the residents of St. John's. No cut in services, but higher taxes. Well, homeowners in St. John's notice a difference. The city brings down its 2019 budget. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Well, a mother in Stephenville is outraged after a teenage boy was cleared of sexual assault charges involving her daughter and other young teenage girls from the area. And now she wants changes to the way the courts treat people who come forward with those kinds of complaints. Here now's Colleen Connors has been following this case and has one mother's powerful message tonight, and she joins us live from Cornerbrook. Colleen. Well, Anthony, while we can't name anyone in this story, their identity is protected by law. We can tell you that these cases have sparked tension and protest in Stephenville. And we can also... The trials played out in a courtroom in Stephenville, where Judge Lynn Cole dropped the sexual assault charges in November. That leaves the mother of the girl who made some of the allegations with emotions of regret and disappointment. Uh, a broken bone will heal in time. A bruise will heal in time. Psychological trauma from sexual assault never heals. It's a wound that does not heal. This is something she'll carry for life. Tears cover her face as she reached for more tissues. Her frustration and hurt comes from watching her daughter take the stand to testify. The boy had pleaded not guilty to sexual assault, assault and an alleged attempt to choke her. A nine-day trial played out the end of June, with the judge eventually deciding not guilty. I think very clearly society is now coming on board with a no means no. So how then can a judge say that her no didn't mean no? The mother believes the judge was wrong and that the justice system failed her daughter, who is now fearful of someone she labels a predator. Well, we will be seeking to have um, a peace bond against him. She is still very fear fearful of him. He has um, gone to her place of work and she was uh, very alarmed by that. She is now seeking better supports within the court system for people like her daughter. So what is it that needs to change in your eyes? Victims are expected to be questioned in a trial scenario like regular people. Um, their ability, they're almost under a disability when they've had psychological trauma. To have the expectation that their testimony is going to be weighed by anybody who has not had a traumatic event occur is absolutely outrageous. Um, because of that trauma, they're not going to remember every single detail of that night. They're not going to remember every little thing. Afterwards, they may not understand how they're supposed to react or respond because there is no right way to respond. Our, our brains protect ourselves and our bodies, so it's going to do what it needs to do to survive. And that may not look like what the courts want it to look like to convict somebody. The lawyer for the teenager who was charged says justice was served in this case because his client was not guilty of any criminal acts. Now the girl's mother will not be seeking an appeal. She doesn't want her daughter to have to testify again. She had hoped for a different outcome for this male youth, using examples like maybe counseling or probation. He was found not guilty in the first two trials he faced, and he will find the decision about his third trial, and that's coming in January. Live in Cornerbrook tonight, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. Well, the City of St. John's brought down its budget late this afternoon, and taxes are going up, but the city says people won't be paying too much extra. The residential mill rate is rising by 0.4, and the water tax will go up by $25 in 2019. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is at City Hall, where he's been all afternoon, and he joins us now live. So, Jeremy, how much more could people be paying in 2019? 
Well, before we get to that, I just want to let you know that the budget literally just passed. There was just a scrum where we're standing here now where Councillor Dave Lane, the lead for finance, spoke about the budget. And uh, basically what we're looking at is nearly, I'm sorry, I got to read off my phone because we're literally just coming out of this. Nearly 80% of households will see an increase of less than $10 a month. So as you said, and was expected, the mill rate did increase by 0.4, going up to 7.7. Also, the water tax, which actually went down by $50 two years ago, is going up $25. So right now we're paying $580. Next year we're going to be paying $605. So the mill rate increase comes after the city had to try to come up with a shortfall of about $12 million. Now the city is phrasing it this way, four out of five households will pay less than $10 a month and one third of homeowners will see no increase or actually a decrease. And here's a little bit of Dave Lane's speech from the budget earlier this afternoon. Residential property values are down slightly overall with the total residential roll dropping by 4.17%. Commercial properties, on the other hand, are up slightly by 1.72%, but total municipal property values together have decreased from $15.9 billion in 2018 to $15.5 billion for 2019. This would mean a shortfall in revenue if we maintain the existing mill rate. This fact, combined with other unavoidable cost increases, including rising electricity rates and debt servicing charges, results in the need to increase the mill rates for 2019. So businesses will be paying more because the commercial mill rate went up 1.4, so it now sits at 26.1. And that's news that's not sitting well with the St. John's Board of Trade. Our members are going to be frustrated that commercial property pay owners are now paying 6% uh, almost more than residential. So the increase in, in uh, taxation is all falling on the hands of business in this, in this uh, budget. Assessment uh, property values went down for residential, whereas they went up for commercial properties. So that's the frustration with this budget in that the overall tax burden is falling heavier on business. So all of council uh, voted in favor of this budget and everyone said it's hard to increase the mill rate but it was something that was needed. Now they are boasting a few uh, good things out of this budget and one of them is that there have been no cuts to service. The city is going to spend $125,000 and hire a new climate change coordinator, a move to sort of uh, step in the right direction, they're saying. And this is going to make a lot of people in St. John's happy. The city has earmarked $150,000 for sidewalk snow clearing removal, something that we're probably going to need uh, in January. So reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at City Hall in St. John's. It looks like good news is on the way for taxpayers in Conception Bay South. The town's budget was also presented this evening and shows no increases in taxes to residents or businesses. That includes no increase in rates or fees either. The budget also shows a decrease in spending of about $560,000. This is the second time in the town's history that administration has been able to reduce year-over-year -year expenditures. That budget includes funding for additional snow removal staff. The mayor says moving forward, he wants to hold the line on taxes as much as he can. It's about adjusting our core values and our core things that we have to provide. And that, that's what we talked about right from the get-go. So we all asked all the directors to go back and look at their budgets. And so we had to move away, you know, from the things that are nice to do to the things we had to do. And that's where we, that's where we settled on. Well, we're well going here we to are. We're sort of confused <laughs> where we're going here. We'll see that promo a little bit yes. later. But yeah. for now, <laughs> let's welcome Ashley to the program. Ashley, winter has arrived everywhere pretty well, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It was a beautiful weekend. I mean, we saw more snow this weekend, but hopefully got out and enjoyed it for the most part. Yeah. These cooler temperatures are helping keeping the snow around as well. Uh, but it does look like we're going to continue to see this, at least for the next week or so. So we'll take a look at the weather on the way through uh, the next say 24 hours we'll see some blowing snow for southeast labrador and then the northern peninsula as well 
We're looking at uh, some blowing snow through the overnight with these gusty winds somewhere between 60 to 70 kilometers per hour and some significant snow at that as well. Otherwise, more snow is on the way for the Avalon. It looks like on Wednesday a system moves in just going to skirt the Avalon, but we could see some significant snow with that system as well. But a warm up towards the weekend means we could eat into some of this snow. Uh, temperatures could reach the uh, single digits on the plus side of the mercury by Saturday. So we'll look ahead a little bit and then uh, of course towards the next 24 hours when I come up in a little bit. <laughs> a lip syncing spectacular. They have been practicing for months, and today the spotlight shines on them, and it's all for a good cause. We'll have that story coming up. Nalcor's former president and CEO is facing suggestions that the Crown Corporation was too quick to exclude future energy options other than Muskrat Falls. But sometimes, or I should say rather, but a sometimes defiant Ed Martin stands by the decisions that were made on his watch. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. I think one of the things that attracted me to, uh, to the role was uh, Premier Williams' vision. Ed Martin says that when Nalcor was formed, it was given a clear mandate. Well, it was clear that uh, we were uh, set up to lead the development of the Lower Churchill. Asked if measures to encourage people to use less power could make other options, such as shoring up the system we currently have more attractive, Martin said no. And when asked about liquefied natural gas, Martin explained why it was excluded as a real option early on. Marrying ourselves to a LNG development uh, to lock in prices long term was not going to work. Ridge is not big enough. It merited a little more, a little more detail than just the phase one screening. No, we screened it out. In fact, we screened it. The answer is no. One report Nalcor had suggested importing power from Quebec could be the answer to the province's energy needs, but Martin said they never asked Hydro Quebec about this because they knew it wouldn't work. We knew that a Quebec uh, didn't have the capacity. Uh, and didn't have plan to have the capacity to sell us uh, that uh, electricity. Um, that was uh, referenced several times um, at the time it was in Quebec's energy plan. Martin was politely combative, and so far he's not giving an inch to any suggestion that Nalcor made mistakes. He's scheduled to testify for four more days this week. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Premier Dwight Ball says there have been no formal meetings about a hydro development with Quebec, but he is open to discussions with that province. Ball and other premiers met with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in Montreal on Friday to discuss a number of issues. At one point, Quebec Premier Francois Legault tweeted a photo of him and Ball saying they talked about hydroelectric potential and development between the two provinces. Ball says they spoke about mining agreements, but that he is open to having discussions around hydroelectricity, particularly around a transportation system to move the electricity around the country. This province has a frosty relationship with Quebec, stemming way back to the Churchill Falls deal of 1969. Any deal would have to be beneficial to people in Quebec, would have to be beneficial from my perspective to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, not put a burden on our province. So this would be a way to generate new sources of revenue, either through economic development or to sale of hydroelectricity, which I said is renewable and clean, which is what our nation is looking forward to. But it really needs a transportation network that could open up those uh, trading corridors. Ball says there are no formal meetings set up, but if they do happen in the future, Nalcor and Hydro-Quebec will be at the table. You can see my full interview with the Premier in about 25 minutes. Husky Energy has completed a preliminary investigation into the oil spill at the Sea Rose platform last month. The company says it has identified ways to improve how it operates in bad weather and that the corporation is committed to preventing it from happening again. The spill was the largest ever in the Newfoundland offshore. Here now is Chris O'Neill Yates has the latest. 
three weeks after an oil spill at the Sea Rose Project, Husky submitted its preliminary report to the Canada, Newfoundland and Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board, the provincial energy regulator. In a statement, Husky says it's identified ways of improving their troubleshooting process, specifically how they manage unusual or infrequent operating conditions, such as those it encountered on November 16th. Waves were topping out at more than eight meters high and winds were at 45 knots when Husky's offshore team tried to restart oil production. The looming question is, why did they try to restart production in those conditions? Husky says it will revise its adverse weather policy around restarting production. 250,000 liters, a mixture of oil, water and gas, spilled into the sea on the Grand Banks, 350 kilometers from shore. Two separate spills ran for a total of 35 minutes. The first spill happened when offshore teams were troubleshooting a pressure drop in the flow line. When they retested it, it caused a second spill. Husky says it's deeply sorry for the incident and committed to learning from it. The company will do an engineering analysis of the flawed flow line connector, but that still has not been recovered from the seabed. So for the fourth week, oil production on the sea rows remains stalled. And at $4 million a day to provincial coffers, that's about $100 million the provincial government will have to wait for. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. A young Whitless Bay couple isn't packing up the farm just yet, despite being forced to dismantle their chicken coop. Gideon Barker and his partner moved to the town, hoping to live a more rural lifestyle. But Whitless Bay says the pair didn't get the proper permit by, uh, for the 4x4 four four coop and that it received three complaints. The town told them to tear it down, and this weekend they did just that. Barker's three chickens, lentil, bean, and McNugget, are being housed somewhere else while he and his partner plan to appeal. McNugget. <laughs> yes, I know. I always <laughs> smile when I have to say that name. Well, a special Christmas fundraiser was held in St. John's today. A lip-syncing show to raise money for the Geraldine Rubia Center, a club for people with special needs. Here now's Karen Stokes has more. Taking care of Christmas. They are taking care of Christmas in their own way. The members of the Geraldine Rubia Club are holding a lip-syncing show. They've been practicing for months, and it's all to raise money for their club. Our clients are adults with special needs in our community, and they come down to our facility on a weekly basis, and, but they had to have a worker with them at all times. We just make sure that the center is uh, safe and ready and available for our clients. This is a fundraiser for us to keep our doors open at the center and things are going, things are going well. Can they, can they do better? Of course they could. It's our Christmas concert. We're doing it, uh, it's lip sync for our clients and our clients are superstars and especially some of our songs that we have today we have the original singers here who are going to perform on stage with the clients so they're extra excited today inclusion is a very very important aspect of the center everybody's included in everything that we do yes i was on the stage it was a good concert we had today that's good everybody loves it fun fun and Laugh and stuff like that, fun. It's Christmas, I'll be home with us all. Try your best, that's all, try your best. That's right. Try your best, try your best. That is excellent advice. And tell me what the centre means to you. It's fun, fun, give me something to do, it's fun. I love the centre, but I play, I play darts there, bingo and, and everything like that. What it means to me, I don't think I would want to be home. I think I want to be just be out all the time. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Oh, there's lots of friends. Yeah. And lots of music. That's mm -hmm. the main thing is the music. Music and friends, right? Yeah. <laughs> music and friends. Side by side, no one can break them. They show me a new kind of perfect every day, and I love that. Love that. Nothing makes the old world right like music and friends. Let's give them a big round of applause for all of our lip sync players. 
Another year without her. Friends, family, and supporters of Corkney Lake are here in Mount Pearl tonight about to light a Christmas tree in her honor. We'll check in ahead on Here and Now. Welcome back. It's been 551 days, a year and a half since Courtney Lake was last seen alive. The 24 year old disappeared on June 7th, 2017. Her case went from a missing persons to a homicide investigation when the only suspect, her ex-boyfriend, killed himself. Lake's body has never been found. Tonight, a Christmas tree lighting is being held in her honor. Here now is Katie Breen is at St. David's Park in Mount Pearl for the ceremony. So Katie, when do things get underway? Well, just in about half an hour, but people are starting to arrive already. There's hot chocolate, Christmas carols. People are preparing to celebrate Courtney's life and her favorite season. I'm joined now by Lisa Lake, Courtney's mom. Hi. How are you doing? Not too bad, thank you. I want to know how your family is doing. We're coping. Every day is a struggle, but we have to go on, you know. Every day is a hope and a wish, but, you know. And this is the second year that you've done this, this now? This is the second annual. We're, we'll be doing this. Uh, it's going to be an annual thing. Why is this something that you do? Well, number one, it was our favorite time of year. Uh, number two, we, we the lights are purple in the tree, not only because it's our favorite color, but it's um, the no, the color for violence against women. So it's bringing it all together. Do you have a favorite Christmas memory of Courtney? Um, 
I have a lot of memories of Courtney. Love to remember is her first Christmas I think has to be has that and, and when her, her brother her brother's first Christmas. Yeah. He was two weeks old. Yeah. And his first Christmas. And you said the tree's going to be lit up in purple. Well, violence yes, it's a it's color of rose purple, I think. It is looks more like a pinkish purple. Yeah. Your family has done some extensive searching for her now. We have. As the time goes on, how how is it that how hopeful are you that you'll find her? Oh, I'm her? still very hopeful. I don't say when I find her, don't say if I find her, I say when I find her. Yeah. yeah. I imagine that would bring a lot of closure. Oh, it would, it would. Yeah, it certainly would. What kind of searching do you continue to do? Oh, we, we, we do private searches, you know, all the time. You know, our searching is far from over. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everyone is with us when you hope to find her. Yes. Like I said, this Christmas tree lighting will be taking place in just about a half an hour. You can hear the carols going on behind us, and we'll check in. Katie Breen, here and now in Mount Pearl. And we'll get to some of the temperatures that they can uh, expect for that uh, ceremony in a little bit when we talk with uh, Ashley. But first, Clark Bishop from St. John's is never going to forget last Friday night. <laughs> The 22-year-old scored his first NHL goal to help the Carolina Hurricanes to a 4-1 win over the Ducks. It's a good goal. Clark Bishop has his first goal well earned in the National Hockey League. As you'll see, it wasn't the prettiest goal. Bishop collided with the Ducks net minder, minder. At first, it was ruled no goal, but a playback showed the puck was over the line before the net was knocked off. There yeah. it is again. <laughs> Still, if it's in, it's in. Bishop also picked up an assist and was named the game's first star. And this was his 11th NHL game. He's been called up by the Hurricanes twice this season. He usually plays for the AHL Charlotte Checkers. And I understand mm -hmm. this makes Clark the only NHLer who's, uh, well, only players playing in the NHL when he gets called up, the only one. Uh, there was a time not From here? very long ago mm -hmm. where we had six active NHLers, but anyway, he's um, the only on his way. Wow. Well, yeah. Keep scoring goals. He might be sticking around, the bigs. <laughs> With any luck. Yeah. <laughs> So back to the weather, cold, hey? It's chilly out there. Uh, temperatures have been in the minus single digits right through the weekend and will continue to do so as we head uh, at least through tomorrow. So we'll take a look at those current temperatures right now. Minus four in St. John's. We've got those single digit temperatures right across the island and then uh, up through Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting around minus eight, minus 15 in Lab City. Now, as far as weather goes, we're seeing most of the action right now uh, up through Southeast Labrador and then into the Northern Peninsula as well. We're starting to see that cloud cover and uh, potential for some snow as we head through the overnight. We could see that snow for the west coast as well. And then that potential for the Avalon to see some flurries as well as we head through the night tonight. We'll take a look at that future track. You can see uh, a little bit of a trough moves through spreading that potential for snow right across the island and then towards the Avalon by the time the early morning hours rolls around uh, into the afternoon. But it's those strong winds that uh, for the southeastern lab for southeastern Labrador that have been strong uh, right through most of the weekend. So we are seeing that blowing snow and that will continue as we head through the night tonight for that northern for the northern peninsula as well. Temperatures dipping though quite uh, dramatically down to about minus 12 for parts of central, especially in those low lying areas. Uh, minus five for Corner Brook, same for Port of Basque, and then temperatures dipping a couple more degrees for the Avalon should sit in the mid minus single digits, but those winds will eventually ease as well. And then up through Labrador along uh, the coast, we're looking at temperatures sitting in the minus single digits. Cold for Nain though, minus 29 with that wind chill. Uh, winds not strong, but sitting at minus 25 for Labrador City, uh, that wind chill feeling closer to minus 35 tonight. So uh, definitely cold there. And then Happy Valley Goose Bay feeling more like minus 23 with that wind chill as well. We do have a blowing snow advisory for the Straits and the Northern Peninsula as we head through the night tonight. And uh, along with some pretty uh, heavy snow at times as well, we could see somewhere between 5 to 10 centimeters, pockets of 10 to 15 centimeters. This is just right through to tomorrow morning. And then uh, as far as what we're expecting across the island, uh, about 2 to 4 centimeters anywhere along the west coast, Buren Peninsula as well as the Avalon could pick that up. And then the northeast coast could see uh, somewhere between 2 to 5 centimeters 
by the time tomorrow morning rolls around and then things should taper to flurries through the afternoon uh, with that temperature sitting around minus four for Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander minus two, minus one in St. John's. Those winds are going to pick up as well. So northwest winds gusting upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour uh, for the Beer and Peninsula. We're looking at temperatures hovering around the zero degree mark and then again some more snow possible for uh, the west coast could pick up another two to potentially four centimeters of snow through the afternoon tomorrow, but those winds will eventually ease. So that's the good news there. Temperatures going to drop for Cartwright down to about minus 10 through the afternoon. Nain minus 15, plenty of sunshine it looks like. And then we've got that potential for some snow and then another cold day for Lab City as well. Uh, but looking ahead towards Wednesday, does look like the next weather maker moves in. This could bring some significant snow to parts of the Avalon. So Environment Canada does have that special weather statement. But we will look at those details when I come up in a little bit. Making sure the boys and girls up north are getting lots of nice gifts for Christmas this year. St. Nick hitches an impressive ride to touchdown in Happy Valley Goose Bay. With Mummers, salt meat on Christmas Day and purity syrup, Christmas in Newfoundland and Labrador is unique. But does anyone really celebrate it any better? On Boxing Day, join us for a look back with A Christmas Past, a special show coming straight to you from the CBC Vaults.
A long-awaited witness has started what is expected to be five days of testimony at the Muskrat Falls inquiry. Ed Martin was president and CEO of Nalcor before and after the massive hydroelectric project was approved. And one of the questions put to him this afternoon had to do with earlier testimony from Derek Sturge, who is in charge of the company's finances. Sturge said he felt out of the loop when it came to the cost of the project. That's business. That's the way it works. Um, I wasn't surprised either way. Um, you know, I look back on, for instance, uh, my experience uh, in mobile oil. Uh, coming up through the system, uh, and or Petro Canada, um, you know, I had the good fortune to be the uh, GBS accountant on the, on the project uh, at Hibernia, and I wasn't involved in cost and schedule at the time. That's not the accountant's role there. Uh, the engineers do the engineering. The engineers uh, cost that engineering out, and they put the schedule together. The accounting people uh, in, in, in that world uh, do not contribute to that because the expertise doesn't sit there. I also came in as project financial advisor to uh, the main project and it was a similar situation. I was doing uh, financial accounting uh, and troubleshooting. I then went back out to the GBS as cost and schedule manager. At that point I was deeply involved in the cost and schedule and I understand how it works and the accountants are not the ones driving the cost and schedule in a mega project. It's as simple as that. And then I went back in as CFO uh, after another couple of, uh, of, of roles, and I ended up being CFO at Hibernia, and that's the way I operated there as well, and I understood uh, the difference. I understood uh, just how the cost of schedule was being handled, and to me that was the norm. And I also believe uh, I heard, uh, and I'd have to check the transcript, but I thought uh, Mr. Sturridge also indicated that he had a similar experience at Valley Inco on uh, construction. This wouldn't surprise me as well if he said that. I certainly think that, I don't think he was suggesting that he would have been involved in developing the costs, uh, uh, in, involved in that kind of, you know, in detail of building the costs. I, I certainly don't think uh, that was his evidence. But I, he did say that, you know, in his notes indicate he, it was very strange. He found it was a very strange process that was being undertaken and that he did not have uh, more transparency as to what the costs were. Uh, at various times, uh, but what, uh, so that's his evidence, but what I'm hearing you say that, uh, that that's the way you expect that you wouldn't expect to keep your VP finance in the loop with respect to information on cost and schedule, is that what I'm you're understanding not, you to say? Not, it's not my job to keep him in the loop. If you're not in the loop, go get in the loop. He's the CFO of the company. Get on with it. it so would you expect him to get himself in the loop? Absolutely. So he's, he's, he's a VP and C, CFO of the company. Doesn't that, uh, anyway, sure. Testimony at the Muskrat Falls inquiry today. Well, a big package arrived on the runway at the Goose Bay Airport today. Pallets of presents were offloaded from a Canadian Air Force plane into the hands of the RCMP. It's a joint operation that brings gifts to some of the more remote points along the Labrador coast. Our Jacob Barker was on the runway to capture the moment when the packages arrived. Here's a look. Beautiful day in Goose Bay to have the toys brought up from Trenton. Good to have the Royal Canadian Air Force bringing stuff for us, making sure the boys and girls up north are getting lots of nice gifts for Christmas this year. I think it's great. It's an awesome opportunity. Uh, I can only happens for us once a year, but it's neat to be able to come up here and provide uh, hopefully a good Christmas for all the kids in the, uh, the northern communities. You had Santa here waiting for you? You know, being able to assist the big guy like that, what do you think? Oh yeah, it's an awesome opportunity for sure. We're going to get the people to uh, come uh, offload our plane and then we'll be on the way for our next destination. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. It's quite an operation. Yes, it is. Uh, Got to make sure everybody's happy you can over the holiday season and this is a big part of it through the RCMP, the military police. It's a great, great thing for everybody. Uh, Canadian Forces Herc just arrived and uh, we uh, had a big loader to unload a bunch of pallets here at the RCMP hangar. To, today we'll sort the presents, wrap them tomorrow, and then they'll head up the coast of uh, Labrador. We'll try to hit as many of the communities in uh, Labrador coast as we can. That uh, will be determined. We're helping supporting an extremely good cause, right? So getting toys to the north, uh, getting toys to uh, underprivileged uh, and people who just don't do not have uh, that kind of access. I mean, it's a big deal. Uh, we're we are privileged to be able to actually do that. 
Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a great cause to support. Still with Christmas, a proud tradition took place in St. John's this weekend. The Mummers Parade drew hundreds in St. John's. People came out in their mummering best, disguising themselves in whatever they could find around the house. Doilies, beer cases, and man's bra were all common sights on the parade route. Mummering is an old Newfoundland tradition going back to the 16th century. People conceal their identities and go door to door to play tricks on their neighbors. It's basically like Newfoundland's version of the running of the bulls. <laughs> so people uh, will wear these very tall uh, cardboard hats covered in ribbons. Their shirts and pants will be covered in ribbons and they would go around on old Christmas Day with a rope and they would give people a little whack with the rope and chase people through the streets. And uh, apparently it was beautiful to see all the ribbons flowing as they ran through the streets. The tradition has been given a push in the last several years with the creation of this official parade. Pretty big turnout there. All right, staying with Christmas, but on a less positive note, if you used Canada Post to send packages to family this holiday season, you might want a backup plan. Canada Post warns there's a backlog of, get this, 6 million packages. And so it's hired 4,000 extra workers to try to catch up. The temporary ban on overseas deliveries has been lifted, but delays caused by six weeks of rotating strikes continue to make delivery times unpredictable. There is some good news in this, though. All the letters to and from Santa, those will be delivered on time. Any deal would have to be beneficial to people in Quebec, would have to be beneficial from my perspective to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. The premiers of Quebec and this province talking about hydroelectric at last week's First Minister's Conference in Montreal. Tonight we're talking to Dwight Ball about those discussions. Welcome back to Here and Now. A tree for Courtney Lake is shining brightly in Mount Pearl. Supporters are at St. David's Park tonight remembering the 24-year-old who police believe was killed a year and a half ago. Their only suspect, her now deceased ex-boyfriend. Here and Now's Katie Breen is in Mount Pearl tonight. Katie, what do you see? 
Well, I see a lot of emotion and a lot of support, but more importantly, what I hear is a lot of singing. You can hear them singing This Little Light of Mine, a song for Courtney. They just finished lighting up the Christmas tree in purple. The light, of course, meant to bring awareness to intimate partner violence and remind people of a life lost too early. Tonight, friends, family, and supporters of Courtney Lake are together remembering her and circling her tree with love. Christmas was Lake's favorite time of year, and the people here are determined to keep the season happy to celebrate in her honor. A year and a half after her disappearance, Lake's family is still hopeful they'll find their loved one. And then you can see that tonight in the optimism. It's glowing just like Courtney's tree. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in Mount Pearl. Premier Dwight Ball is freshly back from a meeting of premiers and the Prime Minister in Montreal last week, and it seems he and the newly elected Quebec Premier Francois Legault hit it off. Here's what Legault said after meeting with Dwight Ball. I was very happy uh, with the uh, private meeting I had with uh, Dwight, the uh, Premier of uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, last night, because we can work on a deal together. Uh, we both have uh, potential projects in hydroelectricity, uh, and uh, I was very happy. Uh, only this meeting, it worked being here. And Premier Ball joins us now from Corner Brook. So, Premier, what did Premier Legault mean when he said, we can work on a deal together, we have both potential projects in hydroelectricity? Well, he's uh, certainly enthusiastic about all the things that we've been currently doing with uh, Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador. And, of course, what I'm referring to there would be the mining sector and the transportation sectors. These were MOUs that I signed uh, in the last you know, few months with the, Quebec, with the government of Quebec. So really building on all of that, but recognizing that Newfoundland and Labrador and Quebec both have uh, untapped hydro resources that we could actually sell to other jurisdictions, or we could actually even use some of that within our own jurisdictions to create economic development. So this is really about untapping the hydroelectricity resources that we have in our province. So and are we talking that. about Gull Island on the Lower Churchill or some potential deal that would impact Muskrat Falls, which, as we all know, is such a financial albatross for us? What we know is that uh, many provinces now across Canada, B.C., Manitoba, Quebec, and Newfoundland and Labrador would have surplus energy uh, resources within their jurisdiction. So what really this is all hinges on a transportation network and a customer to sell those extra resources. So whether we uh, use Gull Island power, Muskrat power, Upper Churchill power in the future, but really what this is about on tapping the resources that are renewable and clean with a transportation network either east-west or north-south that could reach customers at an affordable price. Now, Quebec is building a hydroelectric complex on the uh, Romaine River. It's actually about twice the size of Muskrat. It's focusing on renewable energy for their own needs. So why, beyond what you've said about uh, opening up this highway between provinces, why would Quebec want to make a deal with Newfoundland and Labrador? Well, it, any deal would have to be beneficial to people in Quebec, would have to be beneficial from my perspective to Newfoundlanders and La Labradorians, not put a burden on our province. So this would be a way to generate new sources of revenue, either through economic development or to sale uh, fragile electricity, which I said is renewable and clean, which is what our nation is looking forward to. But it really needs a transportation network that could open up those uh, trading corridors. Premier Ball, do you see this as a new era of cooperation between specifically Quebec and our province? Everybody knows we've been at odds over hydroelectricity for decades. There's a total lack of trust in some quarters. So what's your level of trust? In for the last three years, what I've done is built relationships with many other provinces. We've seen the success that we've had within the Atlantic provinces and also making sure that we have good, meaningful, uh, constructive negotiations or discussions with Quebec on things like mining and the transportation network. So it's, it's just natural that we work with our neighbors on areas that we can find a consensus where there would be economic opportunities for both our provinces and indeed Canada has a, as a whole would benefit from that. But my responsibility is to Newfoundland and Labrador and look for those economic development opportunities that will create jobs 
for our province. Now, the former head of the PUB here, a uh, strong critic of Muskrat Falls, he cautions about dealing with Quebec. Here's Dave Vardy on Friday. I find it very scary to think that this might be, ha be happening, that we might be doing some kind of a trade-off on the Upper Churchill, because the Upper Churchill uh, right now is a, is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, 2041, and uh, we don't need to we we don't need to trade that off, you know, uh, for uh, for short-term gain. We have a financial problem today, and we have to uh, we have to come to grips with that problem. But we can't be stampeded again into making a decision in order to solve Muskrat Falls overnight. So, Premier, just finally, your reaction to those comments? Well, everything I've done when I look at the opportunities and as we make deals with either industry or other province. I do it with the Newfoundland and Labrador as beneficiaries. And we do it with cautious, we do it uh, with due diligence. And so if there's a benefit to be reached for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, these are opportunities that I'd be willing to explore. We're a small province in terms of population, but we have enormous natural resources that are available to us to create wealth for people in our province. If the deal is there, and there is a deal to be made. We will do it only, though, if it's right for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Premier Dwight Ball, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Debbie. Outside our studios, uh, Prince Philip Parkway there. Now, nothing happening right now, but as we head through the night tonight, looking at some more snow, even more so on Wednesday, but I'll have all those details coming up. Now, I did notice uh, before the break on the trees outside when you took a look outside that someone actually put the bulbs up so yes. it didn't look so bleak. It looks nice out there yeah, now. It's really pretty, yeah. yeah. It definitely feels like Christmas is right around the corner now. We have beautiful snowfall and yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, and, you did a little, and you did some gardening too, I noticed. Yes, yeah, we've got some gardening. <laughs> Two weeks from today is Christmas Eve. I need wow. to get on is my it? shopping. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs>
okay. Yeah. I've got to go shop. Yeah, yeah, you do. Well, you might not want to do that tomorrow because uh, okay. we do have some more snow on the way, especially for the Avalanche. If we take a look at that, we have that uh, Environment Canada has a special weather statement in place for most of the Avalon, and that's because that system should move in uh, into the afternoon, and we could see uh, some pretty significant snowfall with this one as well. Uh, agreement isn't the best on this, but uh, it looks like potentially 5 to 10, even upwards of 15 centimeters is possible and could uh, affect parts of eastern Newfoundland as well. So here's a look at uh, what we're expecting as far as temperatures go. Minus one for St. John's Marystown, still uh, hanging around the zero degree mark. We've got cooler temperatures as we head towards uh, the northern peninsula up through the straits as well, sitting around minus eight, minus nine. But it does look like it should just be sun there for the most part. So a lovely afternoon, just a little bit chilly. Cartwright minus 13. Cold up through Nain as well at minus 16. That chance of flurries and then same for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then cold for Labrador City as well, sitting at about minus 22. Expect a little bit of a wind chill, feeling closer to the mid minus 20s, even closer to the minus 30s into the afternoon hours as we tap into some of that colder air. So taking a look at the system, this is overnight Wednesday. This is just one model uh, and that'll move off eventually. And then in behind that, we should see some clearing skies through the day on Thursday. Some more snow potentially up through parts of Labrador, not too much as far as a uh, significant snowfall goes. And then eventually into Friday afternoon, looks like uh, a mix of sun and cloud, maybe some cloudy periods for the most part. Uh, as far as Labrador goes, it looks like a nice afternoon, but we're going to hang on to those colder temperatures. Then more snow moves in through uh, overnight and then a warm up on the way for most of the island. Temperatures could climb up into the single digits on the plus side of the mercury uh, and then potentially some rain as well. So here's a look at the five day forecast. Um, snow and windy on Wednesday. Those gusts could be upwards of 90, even uh, 80 or rather 80 and 90 kilometers per hour. And then staying below zero through to Friday and then Saturday is when we'll start to see that warm up. Those winds will really pick up showing sunshine right now. It's overnight Saturday into Sunday where we should see most of that rain could be a little bit of a messy start as well. Could see some freezing rain with this system. Uh, for central Newfoundland, just a chance of flurries on Wednesday and then looks nice through Thursday and Friday. Just a little bit chilly and then very mild uh, sitting in the minus single or rather plus single digits uh, into Saturday. Same for the west coast as well and uh, temperature sitting around five degrees. And then up through Labrador, those temperatures are still going to stay quite cold through the overnight, especially tomorrow night for eastern Labrador. And then a slight warm up as we head towards the weekend. And then that's the same for western Labrador. Temperatures dipping down to about minus 34 uh, tomorrow night. So definitely looking at those chilly temperatures. So just before uh, we go to break, wanted to show you your weather photo, Whoa. your weather photo. It's uh, that. Do you recognize that place? Uh, so. <laughs> this one we've got. This one we've got. Well, I'll tell you where this photo was coming up after the break. A bit breezy. A little breezy. Always breezy there. Beautiful. Pretty though.
Okay, we have a gorgeous picture just before mm -hmm. we went to the break. Yeah, we'll take it away, take Ashley. Take a look at that shot one more time. It was windy this weekend, and that's a, a gorgeous weather shot there. So we've decided <laughs> we know exactly where that is. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, the shot from Signal Hill. Yeah. I figure you're just feeling sorry for me for getting them wrong of no, late. And no. so you, you put one, even Anthony will get this one. No, it's because Emily sent a beautiful shot it there. It is pretty. Yeah. Do you happen to know uh, if it was Saturday or Sunday morning? This, this was Sunday morning. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Because it kept me from uh, going out to place where it's usually high elevation. Yeah. I said, I can't even take that. <laughs> no, it was cold. Better to watch from the window. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you have any beautiful weather, weather photos just like this one, send it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Thanks so much, Emily. Yeah. That'll do it for us. Thanks for being here mm -hmm. on this Monday. Have a great night. It's probably a busy time for most of us. <laughs> See you back here tomorrow. Good night. Good night.